Welcome to The Practice Podcast, a show created by lawyers to help lawyers in life and business without all the complicated lawyer language. Let's welcome Bast Amron founders and your hosts, Jeff Bast and Brett Amron. Hey, Jeff. Hi, Brett. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? I'm great. You're just all right? Is it? Is it just all right? You know or? what? You know what? I'd like to take that back. Okay. I'm great. Okay. Good. Because I am here sitting next to you and across from our guest today. Our guest. On the podcast. Special guest. Yes. Ooh. Who is it going to be? Ooh. The mystery guest. Our guest today is Jane DePina. Jane is a paralegal supervisor with Bass Dameron, and she has been with the firm since its inception. Well, wow. actually, she was here before the uh, the firm was even formed. Okay. Jane has over 20 years of experience, and she specializes in bankruptcy and insolvency. She has expertise in the administration of creditor trusts and liquidating trusts and bankruptcy litigation and the investigation and prosecution of all types of litigation claims, including director and officer liability claims. She's got expertise with Ponzi schemes and other fraud claims. She has a master's degree in accounting with a specialization in forensic accounting. And she also is a certified fraud examiner. Don't want to leave that one out. And she's a member of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners and the South Florida ACFE chapter. She's also fluent in Croatian, so we can <laughs> chat in Croatian today. We you, cannot, uh, but maybe maybe Jane can offer some uh, tutorial for us on Welcome, some Jane. How do you say hello in Croatian? Stravo, Karbok. Stravo. I like that. Stravo. <laughs> All right. That's every morning now from now on. Welcome, Jane, to the podcast. Thank you. Yes. Stravo. So, so you can you can explain to us because Jeff dropped that and just kind of moved on, which is you were here before the firm formed, right. which is I was, <laughs> which doesn't sound. How did that work? Yeah. So actually, in about two weeks, yeah, two weeks from today, it will be fourteen years since I started working for wow. Jeffrey Bast, mm -hmm. and a few months after working for him as a solo. You guys decided to come together. So we were all sharing mm -hmm. office space. That's right. When you started, I was yeah. already sharing office space with Brett. Is that correct? Or did Brett Yeah, come? we were all renting space over Museum Tower. Yes, yeah, Museum right. Tower. And we're going to go down right. uh, memory lane here for a little yeah. bit. Right. Thanks. So the origin is that yes. Jane and Brett's assistant were sharing an office, and That's right. you guys were scheduling. Initial client meetings, and at one point, I think my recollection is Jane got a call to schedule a meeting with a potential client, and then a minute later, Brett's phone rang, and they were scheduling, a, Brett's assistant was scheduling a, a meeting with the same potential client. Hmm. So we started pitching, we were pitching the same potential mm. clients in the same <laughs> conference room and said, maybe <laughs> we should just form a firm together rather than... Uh, pitching against each other. Yeah, something like that. Something but, like that. Yeah. Anyway, she's yeah. been here long. She's been here longer than us. And yeah. I actually filed the papers to create Bast Amron. Oh, so you're responsible for the formation yes. of this firm. I didn't even know that. Well, he right. says that accusa in a very accusing way. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're responsible. You did, you did this. Yeah. You did this, Jane. So, Jane, how'd you, how'd you become a paralegal? Because you were a paralegal long before you met us. Uh, it wasn't a profession that I sought out. It just kind of evolved that way. I would say that my career started probably when I started working at the UN International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which is a mouthful, ICTY for short. I was recruited from there while I was living in Croatia and attending the University of Zagreb. I had I was full a full-time student and was fluent in Croatian, had to become and they needed to have native speakers of English to work at, at the tribunal. And so I got recruited through a friend who was working there and moved out there with my husband and my, at that time, baby boy. He was almost, yeah, he was still a baby. Off to the Netherlands. Why were you in Croatia to begin with? Oh, uh, that's an even longer story. We got time. Um, we got nothing but time, right? You guys spread uh, um, I, yeah. I got nowhere to be. <laughs> well, my mother's 
Croatian. Right. But she was born in Yugoslavia. Yeah. And I was actually, after I graduated from high school, I volunteered for a year in Guyana in South America. I was doing just volunteer work. I operated local libraries and little neighborhoods. I taught French at a secondary school. I did all kinds of volunteer work and I received a call. And those were very infrequent back in those days. It's before Calls, the cell right? phones. <laughs> Telling me, my parents uh, called and told me that they had sold our house in Ohio. We were living there at the time and that we were moving to Croatia. <laughs> and quite That's honestly, a very common path, right? People, <laughs> right. it's a very common path, Ohio to Croatia. Yeah. Uh, dinner, anyone? Like after that, yeah. like we, how do you finish that conversation? Well, yes. Crazily enough, I was, I was for it. I mean, despite the fact that the country was in the middle of a war. But they were offering a lot of incentives to the Croatians that had left to come back. Mm -hmm. So giving them, you know, citizenship, insurance, no taxes, you know, made it really easy. You could go to the university for free. That was great for my dad. He was excited for us to go to college for free. The only catch was that you had to learn the language. And at that point, I knew nothing except for the curse words that my mother would utter when she would be cleaning the house. We're going to save those so, offline. <laughs> so, yeah. So, three months after I came back from Guyana, mm -hmm. uh, they had already sold the house. We lived in a really horrible motel for three months. And then we went off to Croatia. And despite the, I mean, the war wasn't... I mean, actively, only one time, and I know I say only, but there was only one time that there were actual bombs falling in Zagreb. Most of the, the war, the act of war was happening either in the, on the borders mm -hmm. of, you know, Serbia or Bosnia or in, in Bosnia. And we were very connected with the U.S. Embassy. Anyway, long story short, I learned the language in three months, studying advanced classes in the afternoons, beginning classes in the mornings. So eight hours a day I was studying it. Wow. My dad was taking the classes with me. He did not do so well. <laughs> <laughs> And I had to take entrance examinations for the university to, to prove that I knew the language and I passed and got in. At that time, I was studying education, so it was a different path than, than, um, mm. than I, I'm on today. But That's amazing. I, I, I want to go back for one second, not yeah. to go too far into the, into the past, but when you're living in Zagreb and there is a war going on, mm. I know you said only one time there was a bomb <laughs> nearby, which would freak me out. Yeah. But we here living in the United States can't fathom that, no. right? So what's that like walking around every day? I mean, do you, is that on your mind as you're walking around or is it just become sort of normal to know that, well, there's a war going on, but we're okay here? Or? Well, and we came here by choice. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Like, well, I mean, everybody who's heard the story thinks that my parents are absolutely insane. And had I been the parent, I don't think I would have made the same decision. Mm -hmm. But my dad was always very adventurous. And because we didn't really see the war actively, mm -hmm. for him, it was almost exciting. He would... <laughs> Our, his entire family thought that we were like in bunkers and and there were bombs falling every day and he would let them believe that and oh, write Instagram letters. Oh, Instagram was alive back <laughs> then what he would have created. Uh, but, you know, the family was yeah. in Ohio. His family was No, uh, was no. Family? We, I have family all over. Oh, okay. I come from a very right. large family. But they, weren't, but, they were in the U.S., right? <clears throat> Those. Yeah, they were all in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we didn't really see a whole lot of it. If we would venture out and go, there were certain places like there there's, you know, Croatia is really well known now for its tourism. Mm -hmm. And there are some destinations that everybody knows about. There's this one place called Plitvica National Park, which is a beautiful place in the countryside that has waterfalls. And mm -hmm. it's all over social media. But when we went there, it was open, but you could only go to certain parts of the park because there were landmines all over oh, the place. Geez. So you could follow certain paths, but you couldn't go and hike in the woods like you would have done, Brett. Yeah. Okay. But <laughs> now it's cleared, oh, you know. Right. Beautiful country. But you could see the scars. You could see, you know, certain towns that you could see they had been, there'd been some shelling. But where the most damage was really being done was on the borders and, and definitely in Bosnia. Another reason why I was recruited by the ICTY is because I could read Cyrillic. Now, Croatia, 
you know, Croatian language, they don't use Cyrillic. It's mm-hmm. in Serbian. They use Cyrillic. And I had taken a year of Russian in high school. So just enough to learn Cyrillic. And it's slightly different, but it was enough. So I had that. So it was a, it was a unique combination. So yeah, they had me take a test at the UN headquarters in Zagreb and I was... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so Cyrillic is a is a language. It's or an alphabet. It's an alphabet. Okay. Yeah. So it's you know if you've seen any kind of Russian print, you know backwards R, you know ends that are eyes and mm-hmm. things like that. So it's a little harder to process, but but I knew it. Can you read it now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I really don't speak Russian because you know sometimes when you're learning a language that is similar to another, once you've used another language a lot. It gets replaced in your mind, but you know, from the the first language you were learning, like Spanish, Portuguese, I mix those up all the time. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinated. Wow. So, so the the um, team that I was working on at the UN was investigating concentration camps that were mostly Bosnian Muslims that were interred there. We had like an entire vault of documents that were seized from different police stations and I had to, we had to read them we had to find the evidence it was all very very manual and we had an excel spreadsheet where mm-hmm. we would enter in like the translations right. that and, was high tech yeah excel yeah time, it right? was and we had a we had diskettes you know those, oh, those yeah. floppy yeah, disks floppy that yeah, we would save them on the little ones little hard ones yeah oh, mm-hmm. okay. but right. funny aside we had a you know, at the UN, you have very international staff, so people from everywhere in the planet. And our division supervisor was from New Zealand, and we had a really, really big office. There was lots of desks and lots of people from all over former Yugoslavia on the team. And our supervisor came in and said, tomorrow you're going to get new disks. And we were really excited. We're like, wow, because these desks <laughs> right. that we have are such crap. We, you know, we, <laughs> we were excited. We were going to get a new desk. It was going to be a new office, you know. And then the next day he came with a box of floppy disks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, disks, not desks. desks. Right. Ouch. Yeah, it was so, Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I am sure we could do an entire episode on <clears throat> your work yeah, at the yeah. UN and the criminal courts. How did you find yourself <clears throat> yeah. back here in right. the United States? It was two years working there. It was very intense. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to to sustain that kind of work and the kind of investigations we were doing. Just emotionally, um, you mean? Emotionally yeah, and that. you couldn't yeah. talk about it. Right. It was very, very, very high security. And, you know, and I also, I wanted to grow with the UN organization, but at that time I hadn't finished my degree. Mm-hmm. So my bachelor's degree, because I had left in the middle of my degree from Croatia that I, I was two years into it. So we made a decision to go back to the U.S. My parents had moved back with my brothers to Colorado. And so we decided to move back so that I could go back to school. And then um, I eased into it by first taking a paralegal certificate course because I got a job with a, a local attorney in Fort Collins, Colorado, and he gave me exposure to a lot of different kind of legal work. We did bankruptcy, and he mm-hmm. said, hey, I'll pay for you to do the paralegal certificate course, and then I'll give you a raise when you finish it. And I said, okay. Sounds like a good nice. deal. Yeah. So, nice. yeah. yeah. So, just kind of <clears throat> fell into it. And-, and now you are not only a paralegal, but a certified fraud examiner. Yeah. So, wait, so, for the folks out there who don't practice in this area, what, is it, what does that mean, a certified fraud examiner? There's a association of certified fraud examiners has a accreditation, the certification for for people who want to specialize in investigation of fraud. So there's a very rigorous, you know, sort of uh, process you have to go through. You have to go through applications. You have to have referrals. You have to have experience. You have to have knowledge. You can have a combination of both. I had obtained my master's degree. At, at FAU in forensic accounting. That was a very, very demanding but exciting program. I was able to do it completely online while working here mm-hmm. full time. And it was it was always my goal to be a CFE. And and you know what led me to that mm. was working on that very exciting fraud case with Mr. Amron over here. Oh yes. 
Yeah. That very exciting unnamed, we should name. That sh- unnamed fraud yeah. case. Yeah. yeah. We, we've only had one. No, that <laughs> no. one that led you down the path. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. So you worked was, on an right. exciting fraud case yeah. and yeah. decided, all right, I want to. And yeah, you got to see what the forensic accountants were doing and, yeah. and, and the kind of digging that we do here, which mm-hmm. equates a little bit to, because I know I have a very different, but I have some criminal right, right. Uh, work in, in my past. And right. so you worked at the criminal court that you went as well as paralegal. And so while we're not doing criminal work, right, yeah. we build the cases yeah. as if you were working as a prosecutor or on behalf of criminal court, right? Right. It's not right. that different. It's yeah. not that different, right? Well, Cause you have a claim and you have to support it. Right. So. Or you're developing the claim. Right. You're yeah. basically recreating a story. You're telling a story about something that happened about someone who's probably not helping you tell that story. Yeah, you know? yeah for sure. Right. No. Yeah. And in that particular case, mm-hmm. I mean, we really started with almost nothing, but we had, oh boy, that was fun. In the middle of summer, many storage in a few sites and that Document was storage. yeah before we even had any e-discovery platforms mm-hmm. and I was working with two of our attorneys one who had just had a baby mm-hmm. and one who was pregnant mm-hmm. and <laughs> and then going through boxes and those storage facilities to manually flag those documents yeah. and right and you so know. for the benefit of the listeners those storage facilities that are just warehouses of documents yeah. they don't have comfortable you, chairs. And usually you don't no. have air conditioning, no. right? Not the at lighting all. Lighting isn't great. Right. You don't have a phone nope. with the flashlight at that time either. Nope. Even right, no. And that was, I mean, that was the norm, right? Back yeah. in the day. Yeah. It wasn't um, that long ago, but. No, but before that, but yeah. like even it was, yeah. it, that was it. It was, right. all right, well, there's a room of a hundred boxes as an example. All right, we got to, let's sit down and yeah. pick one and start going through them. I almost long for those days <laughs> only because you could get through it rather quickly, right? Like you can open a box and say, let me see, is there anything in this box? Anything yeah. that looks like it's, we right. have to look at it in more detail. If it is, put it over there. If right. not, put it over on this, in this yeah. pile and whittle that hundred boxes down fairly quickly and then double back. Now we get what? Well, <laughs> seven now you, terabytes of data. Oh, seven. That's conservative right, now. Right. I mean, now it's all data. I mean, most data in companies now is kept electronically. And you right. get a lot of crap. Can I say crap? You, <laughs> you, lo- you get a lot of crap in those documents. We'll just bleep it out, right? You'll bleep we it out. We don't need to bleep <laughs> crap out. <laughs> I'm just, I'm crap, crap, crap. We don't, I don't think we have a bleeping. But yeah, I mean, I we should work on that though. (laughs) Nelson, work on the bleeping (laughs) censorship. Right. So, okay. So, when we now in the age of electronic Mm. information and e discovery, when we are hired in these cases, and let's use as an example, we get hired by a fiduciary, whether it's a receiver, an assignee, or a Mm -hmm. trustee, to come in to investigate potential claims, right? And we have this data set that is typically the debtors or, you know, the company's yeah. books and records. And we have to go in and get it. How do we do that? Well, we've, we've dealt with a lot of different kinds of situations. Mm-hmm. We've had where we didn't know what there was at mm-hmm. all or mm-hmm. where right. it was. Right. So we have to first identify who are all the parties, where is all the data? And a lot of times, in fact, I think, Probably in every one of our cases, we're never 100% sure that we have all the data. Of mm-hmm. course, we at learned least at that. First, right? Yeah. We had one, one case where I had to actually pull off of Google the G Suite, the documents, had to retrieve it. And, you know, we did, did that very manually mm-hmm. and then pull all of that data and then upload it into our e discovery platform. But sometimes, I mean, you've got, you could have physical, physical assets that have data on them. You've got laptops, phones. I mean, it's it's getting increasingly more complex, that's for sure. Right. And I would say more expensive, but we are I think that we're very good at at deciding on what would be, you know, data that is usable and I won't say support our claims because we don't know what's in there. But if there's like data that's just like backup tapes for something, mm-hmm. you know, we're not, we know that's not going to be data that's usable. It's not going to be communications. We want to make sure that we have 
everything that we need to do our investigations, whether it right. helps or hinder us, hinders us, we need to have it. But I think our tools, we use a lot of tools to go through that data. We have a really good strategy of how to tackle it, how to run search terms, mm-hmm. how to find all the relevant parties. I think we've got it almost down to a science at this point. In some cases, you know, we talk about emails, right? Emails, yeah. especially given the size of some of these companies mm-hmm. and the number of employees, how do you manage that? First, you have to find where they house that yeah. the emails, right? Yeah. And in some cases, we've had it where it's up in the cloud. Yeah. And sometimes that's a little easier. And sometimes it's housed on a server at the company. Right. With yeah. one of our tools, we're able, if it is a cloud server, we're able to import through to our tool, Mm -hmm. our e-discovery tool. But we're not going to go and import every single user's email box. Right. I mean, you could have hundreds of people in a company and, you know, maybe only 10 of those users will have data that's that's something that we that we need. Right. So that's why we identify who all the quote unquote players are in a case. Who are all the people that dealt with the mm-hmm. with the issues, with the data? Who are the decision makers? Who are the middle managers? Right. And you're not going to go to every every lower level employee that may just be, you know, emailing back and forth about what lunch they ate, you know. So so right. we're selective what we choose to import again because of cost to at least to start and then yeah you know, if you yeah really find that oh there's for sure you'll right. see yeah. that there are other people yep it's an iterative process yeah you start you as you're reviewing the emails you start seeing oh well this person here she keeps on popping up so then we'll go and we'll pull her email too and import that and yeah that's how how it grows and like I said it's it's been yeah. working yeah but I and I think. To most people, you know, that type of process would just seem overwhelming, yeah. you know, to such a degree. And oftentimes we're doing that in under extreme time pressures, not right. to mention the hostile environment where, for example, you mentioned the cloud, but maybe we don't have the passwords or we're not getting the passwords mm-hmm. and we're fighting with the other side to get the passwords so we could gain access or, or they give us a password and it doesn't exactly work. Or, <laughs> We've had that a time or two. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. There's ways to hack into that, but that becomes expensive and time-consuming. Yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. another hurdle in, yeah. a, in a challenging process. And I'm definitely not a hacker. We have to we get a third people. party we to do that, hackers. computer That's forensics right. to do that. But, but I think that part of the way that we handle these cases is that before we start with with importing anything, we have a plan. We identify who, again, who all the players are, what are all the potential data sources? You know, we don't just go in blind into a case. Yeah, you would right. be overwhelmed if you just... If you just heard 10 terabytes, you'd be, you know, it's just a just yeah, done. We have a few cases. We've been told there's like 20 terabytes of data, but whoever's got the data or if, if we send it to a forensic or even if it's something that I have mm-hmm. that I can, I create a file tree so that I can see the directories I had one where, you know, I've got directories and directories of of someone's iTunes account. So I've got all of their music playlists. So I've got a really good sense of what kind of music they like. And sometimes you can tell a lot about if I by the music that you're listening to. Um, Small F, not big F. But that's a lot of data. What do you, you know, why do you like this kind of work? (laughs) By the way, maybe that's presumptuous. Um, Do you like (laughs) that? I wouldn't be here for 14 years. Exactly. Why do you, why why do you, why why do you, why do you love the fraud cases? Well, I love investigation. I never take people at face value. You know, but I also, yeah, and I, yeah, I have a really good nose for, for BS. And, you know, and we live in Miami and South Florida is very fertile ground for, for fraud and mismanagement. Yeah. I mean, I think that's why we're, we're so right. busy. Yeah. I also like that we're the good guys. Yeah. I, I love that we Absolutely. get the opportunity to we write certainly wrong. think that. I think there's no, other people who might disagree. We yes. are coming in after the fact wrong. when someone committed a wrong and we're trying to write yeah. it and we're trying to protect Absolutely. the people who are harmed. And it's really, this is true. we are lucky that we have that opportunity. Well, that's really one of the reasons I I loved bankruptcy, and when I started working in bankruptcy, because I always saw it as as a way to help people, because that's always been my my instinct since a kid, you know, from a big family, always helping people. I went right. off, did the volunteer service, so I know that bankruptcy for 
most people, it's because they're really in a bad situation and they need to get out and right. it's a way to help them, you know, get on their feet again. But but like you said, it's it's a pleasure for me to to work on cases where I know that there was some wrongdoing right. and to figure out how it was done and and see justice. I have a strong sense of justice. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's nice because there's, yeah. there's generally, not always, a clear line between, you know, the good guys and the bad guys in a lot of these cases. And so, you know, sometimes it's well, not always so clear. No. But in many of these, it is, and you— you know that we're working on the, you know, for the benefit of people who were harmed, creditors. And, and there may be good people yeah. with good intentions, but man, they just screwed it up. Yeah, that's and, true. And that, it's not always. And, right. and, and therefore, you know, they yeah. still have liability. It's not always you know? intentional. Yeah, that's it's, a good point. Sure. It's, you know, not always. But good people you, make bad usually. decisions too. Yeah. No, but. That's but, true. Yeah. But, yeah, we're no. not saying, by the way, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you're, you're right. But, but there are. bad yeah. people is wrong. Is, yeah. Is yeah, there's. Yeah. They there is acted, no. Their behavior was It's bad. very seldom so black and white, like we're good versus bad. It's always that murky area in the middle. But. Gray. But it's very satisfying work that you know that you're mm-hmm. you're doing something to try to recover because we've also worked on lots of cases where we're having a lot of contact with the creditors the administration of of, of creditor trusts where you hear those stories every day yeah. people who invested their entire life savings it's their retirement or yeah this is their retirement and yeah. then you've got to tell them i'm sorry but it's gone you're going to get maybe 3% you know right. so we try so hard really this is this is not just about you know our success as a firm but also how we give back and that's a big part of of Bast Amron is giving yeah. back to the community. Right. And this is one of the ways that we do that. Right. And I know that in the end, we can't make everyone happy. Creditors will get what they get, but we will do our utmost right. to get the maximum for them. Yeah. It's and a tough, it's, they're usually tough situations because like yeah. you said, people have invested, maybe they invested in some type of fund or something or a company yeah. that they took their retirement. They worked their whole lives to build mm-hmm. up a nest egg and they thought they could invest it. In, and then maybe this was a safe place to put it. And they were probably getting statements yeah. in the mail that sure. showed all the earnings. And and then suddenly it's, no, all that was, you know, a lie. Yeah. And, and there's generally a lot of animosity. And so we do our best to try to communicate mm. with them. And it's a tough area because mm. we didn't create the mess. We're just kind of there to clean it up. Yeah. And, but I think, you know, and you tend to be on the front lines and you do a great job of, you know, communicating with these people in an empathetic manner. So we're in a a unique situation, right? In a lot of these cases, we come in, the lawyers are not in a unique situation, but the client is in that, in that the client wasn't there at the time. Yeah. The events occurred that are now being investigated, the right? The trustee, receiver, right. SME, right. whatever, right. court appointed fiduciary comes in after the fact. Mm-hmm. And so we can't sit in a room with our client and say, okay, tell us your story. Right. We are starting with yeah. a, a general sense of, okay, something happened mm-hmm. here, which led to the failure of this entity that is now in a, an insolvency proceeding. Mm-hmm. Maybe we, you know, there's been some litigation, maybe there's been some criminal stuff, which we've had as well. And then maybe there's some creditors that are chirping in our ear about things. But it's generally a blank slate that we have oh, to yeah. go figure it out and put the puzzle together, Yeah, right? We have to reconstruct it all right. and find out exactly what happened. Right. I mean, that's satisfying too. It's a good story. Yeah. Yeah. It's Complete not, the puzzle. It's right? kind of yeah. like, yeah, when you dump that box out of puzzle oh, pieces yeah. and you get the frame together <laughs> yeah. and then you start, because of course you so, start with the edges. Right? So we talked a lot about, you talked a lot about the collection of the data, Yeah, right? This massive data set, if you can get pieces that mm-hmm. would help sort of stem the tide of like this, ma- you know, it's an overwhelming amount of data. Right. But then we have to extract information from that, right? Right. In order to... We're not going to go through 10 years of emails, you know, and just go you mean one every by single one. one. No, no, no. <laughs> and look at, there's an inbox, there's a deleted box, yeah. there's a sent box, there's, you know, we're yeah. not going to, you know, then you have all the folders and yeah. we're not going to do that. No. Right? No. We'll do a few things. I mean, we'll run search terms because we've been doing this for so long. We know the kind of words that come up. 
things that would be triggers. Also looking at specific communications between specific parties. Mm-hmm. Time you periods, know, right? Yeah, time yeah. periods. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we know specific events occurred, we'll focus on that. Um, that time frame. You can't see I'm gesticulating. Right. Here. Yeah. <laughs> And as we go along and we'll we'll tag things with specific themes. And that's that's another thing that that evolves as we're reviewing is we start to see what those themes are. Mm-hmm. And then that that's part of building the story. Right. We also, you know, take copious notes as we're going along and building that story. Mm-hmm. So that I think we always, you know, know where we are at the time. But it, it definitely grows and we learn we learn new things, sometimes good, sometimes bad, and our story grows. And then when we feel that we have built that story, we mm-hmm. have reconstructed um, what we need, then we're ready to make our claim. It's a true investigative mm-hmm. trail, right? And it leads yeah. you on many paths. It's impressive. It's yeah. impressive. I, I, I agree. I'm impressed by I, by. By you guys. I'm impressed. By you both. Jane, this has been fun. I feel like we well, uh I we feel like go we, on. Only, <laughs> we could go scratch on. the surface, but we're gonna we'll have to have you back on the show. There's a number of topics upon which we can have you back for individual episodes. Right. Yeah. I feel like we could do one on the whole UN and you know. Oh, that's fascinating. Anyway. I, I I yeah, that could be really fascinating. Parallels but this, with this, the Ukraine. The, this was yeah, fun. For sure. Nelson, thank you. Jane, thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star review. Share the show with your friends and family. Follow us, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And please catch us next time. Thank you, Jane. Thank Thank you, you, Nelson. For more information on this show and other resources, visit FastAmron.com and connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram at FastAmron.com.